with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 26 as we engage the furthering of our series on the role of the woman in the New Testament church. The role of the woman in the New Testament church. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, but if you are reading another translation, you should have absolutely no difficulty following the thought process of this context. What is the outcome then, brothers? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three, and each in turn, and one must interpret. But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? If anyone think he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Therefore, my brothers, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. Is that in your Bible? I want to, as we look at this part of the series, I want to further put a subtitle that will give guidance to where we are, and that subtitle is Understanding Silence in the Corinthian Assembly. Understanding Silence in the Corinthian Assembly. Those of you who are students of Scripture are probably familiar that the letters of the Corinthians is probably some of the more controversial documents of the New Testament. The tension that existed between the Apostle Paul and the Corinthian church is obviously seen through a cursory reading of the text. The Apostle Paul was responsible for the planting of this congregation, um, and we can read about that in Acts 18 during the second missionary journey, when the Apostle Paul baptized Crispus and his household, and we find that the establishment of the Corinthian church is recorded by Luke in the book of Acts. When you read the first letter of the, of the Corinthian document, which we have, 1 Corinthians chapter, excuse me, 1 Corinthians, the book, um, is actually not 1 Corinthians. There was another letter before 1 Corinthians that we do not have in our possession. We know that because of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul indicates that he wrote a previous letter before 1 Corinthians, 
and which makes Second Corinthians, at the very least, Third Corinthians, because there were probably several letters written by the Apostle Paul under the heading or that was written to the recipients, the Corinthians. So we have two out of the several letters Paul has written that is indicated within the fabric of the Corinthian corpus. Now, that being the case, be mindful that you need not lose any sleep whether or not we have the other documents of Corinthians or not because we struggle obeying the two that we have. And so um, let's focus on the two documents that we have, and I think you'll do just fine uh, doing that. There'll be enough to get you to heaven if we can manage First and Second Corinthians. Now, um, be mindful that as you read through the document and you're reading First Corinthians and Second Corinthians, you begin to see a plethora of issues that are indicated by the phraseology now concerning. So as you read 1 Corinthians, many times you'll run into Paul saying now concerning because these were issues that were brought to his attention, some of them through the house of Chloe and others through members of the Corinthian church. So Paul addresses a plethora of issues in Corinth. Now, Corinth as a city was known as a city of immorality. It, in fact, when you said you were from Corinth, it was automatically assumed that you were a person that was probably promiscuous or you were a person of immorality. To be a Corinthian meant that you were inherently sometimes an immoral or, or inherently an immoral person. And so the reputation of Corinth is worldliness and carnality. Now, um, when you read through the document and you're careful, uh, by the time you get to 2 Corinthians, we'll leave it in 1 Corinthians, but 2 Corinthians, you start seeing tension between Paul and the recipients. There was an attack on Paul's apostleship, and there was an attack on his motive, and there was an attack on whether or not he did ministry genuinely. And you'll find Paul having to defend his apostleship as you're reading through these letters. Now, issue number one that we find is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. There is a division over preachers. Some say, I am of Paul. Some say, I am of Cephas. Some say, I am of Christ. Uh, and I'm, in, I'm always amazed that Christ was one of the categories over which they were divided. They were divided over Apollos and Peter uh, and Paul and Christ. And Paul has to refute this mentality by saying, was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into Isotoanoma, into my name or into my possession? In other words, Paul poses these two rhetorical questions to refute the idea that there should be any division over belonging to the human vessel that is uh, a preacher. It is not the notion that we should uh, not, in, not encourage or not follow the leadership of the man of God, but it is to suggest that there is no belonging to. We all belong to Jesus is Paul's point here. In chapter 2, there is division over worldly wisdom. In chapter 3, he continues that thought of carnality um, within the context of the Corinthian church. In chapter 4, he needs to put the role of the minister in proper perspective as a servant of the Lord. In chapter 5, there was a young man who has had a relationship with his stepmother or the, the wife of his father and the church um, it has to deal with that reality. And then chapter 6, you have them going to court over trivial matters. And then in chapter 7, you have Paul having to put in perspective the current distress under the heading of trying to manage how they deal with marital relationships. And so he deals with the various married groups to the married, uh, and then he deals with the non-married groups to the unmarried, and then he has a group called to the rest who were married to an unbeliever, and he teaches them how to deal with that reality. Chapter 8, they are divided over eating meats to idols. In chapter 9, they are divided over whether or not the man of God, the preacher, should be compensated. In chapter 10, he has to remind them not to be caught up in worldly wisdom and not to follow the example of the wicked or the rebellious Israelites. In chapter 11 is when he now has to regulate some of the aspects of what was happening in public assembly and we find we finally get to the issue in which our text is located and there was an issue over spiritual gifts. And so I want to deal with the context and the instruction to women in the context of him dealing with spiritual gifts. Now, I want to um, say to you 
that when we deal with the subject of the role of the woman, we have to deal with it with some perspective of humility. Now, what that means is that within the history of theology, in the history of the New Testament church, in the history of how the church has developed, we must always be honest enough to admit when we miss the target. As a theologian, as an academician, as a preacher, as a teacher, as a member of the church, you have to be humble enough to admit that the Bible is infallible, but your understanding is not. That understanding is always in process of developing, is always in process of learning. We're always in process of wrestling with the sacred text. In other words, the more you study the context and the culture and the historical grammatical implications and follow that into an application, you have to be humble enough to admit when you've been wrong. Women in the church, we have to be mindful that within culture, they have had to deal with the mindset of subjugating gender. And if you are anti-racism, then you must also be anti-subjugating gender. That is, if women have struggled with being mistreated or mis or, or not valued, or treated as the lesser gender, many times under the heading of religion, then we must mi may be mindful that there's a need to teach this subject so that women are clear about what God says, but also what God did not say. Because there's some things that culture said that chauvinistic men have said that has nothing to do with what God said. And so we got to be able to distinguish the difference between the two. Now, so we want to be we want to be sensitive to why women have questions. I think it's right for them to have questions as it relates to the permissibility of what they can contribute to the kingdom of God. But women have a right to have those questions. In light of the experience of what culture has done historically, they have a right to ask questions. And we need to answer those questions. On the reverse side of that, women must not assign to a word a negative connotation because that word has been abused. Let me break that down a little further so you get where I am with that. We must not assign a negative connotation to the word submission because the word submission has been abused. In religion, we do that all the time. It, there is an assigning that that means that somehow, some way, my job is to be quiet, be unseen, and work in the remotest parts of the church so that my presence is not felt. That is not what that means. The text that I want to look at is a pneumatikos charismata text that simply means it is within the context of what we call spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 1, you look at it in your Bible. Um, he says, now concerning, remember I just mentioned that whenever Paul indicates issue within the church, he starts with the phraseology, now concerning. Now concerning. Now he says, now concerning the pneumatikos charismata. Now concerning the spiritual. And he picks up the word gifts in about verse 4, in which it is the spiritual or the miraculous gifts. Now as Paul regulates the miraculous gifts, the two gifts that were most prominent were prophecy and tongues. So prophecy and tongues were the two gifts to which there was extreme tension and argumentation. 
relative to which gift was most important. And there was a lack, stay with this word, there was a lack of submission, mutual submission among the gifted people. God, I wish I had time to dive into that. So there was a, there was a lack of submission. I'm using that word on purpose. There was a lack of a disposition to serve because of the dispositions of thinking that one gift was superior to the other. You have to be careful when people are gifted. Gifted people can be some of the greatest servants in the church and simultaneously some of the most dangerous. Because giftedness often gives the impression of privilege. As opposed to seeing the gift within the context of what benefits the church, People can then argue about which one of the gifts is most significant. They did it in the miraculous context. Y'all with me so far? Walk with me through it now. So as you go through 1 Corinthians 12, 12 is an outline of what are the gifts. Chapter 13 deals with the duration of the gifts. So as he goes through the dissertation on love, his argument is that out of all the gifts that exist within the miraculous, the one gift that will outlive all gifts is love. And if you can't use your gift in harmony with love, then he says then your gift becomes a detriment rather than a benefit. You find that's the reason to love. I know we read that chapter at, in weddings. I know. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 has become the wedding chapter. You know, it's just, you know, love does not do this. Love is not uh, unseemly. Love, and we go through the first, and that's good, I, you know, because it works for marriage. But he's not even, here he's not using it primarily for marriage. He's using it for how you do ministry. I can't get no help here. He's using it with how you use your gift. It is very difficult for people to serve certain people if they don't love the person they serve. In. Y'all not hearing me. And so love as, an, as a doctrine is located in 1 Corinthians 13 to say this. Prophecy will fail. Tongues they will cease. And then he says, but the ones that will abide is faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of those three... Is love. Does that make sense? Now, when you get into chapter 14, he gets back into the uh, pneumatikos charismata argument, and he begins to regulate prophecy in tongues. Now, I want to invite your attention to where the regulation becomes more specific. All right? Now, look at verse 26. Look at verse 26. What is the outcome then, brothers? When you assemble, each one has a psalm. That's a miraculous psalm. So in this context, this is a person who had the ability to provide a psalm from a, from a miraculous gift. You have a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, has an interpretation. If you notice, all of these stem from 1 Corinthians 12 where he articulates the spiritual gifts. Look at the, the, the C clause of verse 26. He says, let all things be done for edification. You see it? So, so everything that the gifted person does, whether you have a tongue, whether you have a prophecy, whether you have a teaching, whether you have a psalm, whatever your giftedness is, he says the purpose of the giftedness is for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. Now, let me tell you what edification is. Edification is not about feeling good. It's not about fried chicken. And it's not about a food fellowship. Oh, man, I went to I went to that dinner and it was so edifying. That ain't it's we redefine these words. Edification has nothing to do in this context with having a great time. Oh, man, we went and uh, all the Christians, we got together. And when we got together for the picnic, man, we ate so much and we played games and I left feeling so edified. Okay, I'm not mad at that use of the word. It's just not a Bible use of the word. Edification in this context has everything to do, watch this, with the church being built up through the process of understanding. If I don't grow and learn, I ain't being edified. 
if you're not if you're not if you're not growing in your understanding and in your knowledge then it's not biblical edification biblical edification is also always the process of a person receiving understanding uh, so he says if you got a tongue if you got a revelation if you got a psalm whatever that gift is you're manifesting let all things be done that the church might be built up or edified what do you mean edified it means that they come to an understanding that's what that means so if, the, if a person is hindered, have, help me, Jesus, if the person is hindered in the assembly from understanding, then the church is not being edified in the assembly. That's his argument here. So you are now assembled together and you are exercising giftedness, but edification is being hindered because folk don't know what you're saying. So you a tongue speaker speaking in an unknown language, but if nobody interprets what you're saying, then the church can't be built up. If you have a prophecy or a teaching or a psalm and you do it in a chaotic way, the church has its edification hindered. He says, let everything be done to edify. Now watch how the edification takes place. Look at verse 27. If anyone speak... In a tongue, it should be by two or three, the most, stay with me, at the most three, and each in turn, and one must interpret process. How do we make sure edification happens? We need it to be one, let it be two or three that do this gift and make sure they do it in turn so that another person can interpret what's being said. Watch this. Look at verse 28. But if there's no interpreter, watch the word that's in the context before it ever gets to a woman. He must keep silent. First occurrence of the word that we only see in verse 34 when it occurs here in verse 28 before it ever gets to women. If the tongue speaker does not have an interpreter... Silent. He must be willing to be submissive enough to say nothing. Let me define silent. You see how we run the women, but we don't get it in the context? We, we're all quiet. Women keep silent in the church. Sometimes you keep silent. Let your women keep silent. That's where we like to go. Here it says, if you tongue speakers have a gift, but the interpreter is not present, silent. Silent here, by the way, is different from the word in 1 Timothy 2 that says quietness. Or, I suffer not a woman to teach the use of authority of the man, but to be in silence. That's quietness. That means a humble disposition of quietness. This is different in this context. Silent here in all three occurrences I'll deal with means absolute quiet. Don't say nothing. I'm going to explain why is that in this context. But if there's no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. No interpreter? Be quiet, sir. Absolute quiet. Absolute silence. Does that make sense? All right, let me keep going. I won't have time to really get into this like I want to. Let two or three prophets speak and let who is seated, watch this, but in, excuse me, let two or three prophets speak and let the other pass judgment. Now, the way that works is if a guy got up and claimed he had the gift of prophecy, you needed a person who could judge the validity of that prophecy. In other words, just because you say you got a word from God, it needs to be tested. So God gave another gifted person, have mercy that had the ability to determine and assess whether or not what the person just spoke was actually a prophecy. Just because you say you got a prophecy, we need somebody who can measure it. Let one judge. In other words, he had the gift called discernment. Y'all following that? You see the checks and balance here? All right, now watch this. Uh-oh, here we go again. Look at verse 30. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first must keep silent. Y'all are not getting there. Tongue speaker, no interpreter, silent. Prophet, 
if another person gets a revelation that's next to you, you be quiet. Because what we, well, here's what Paul is doing. What we do not want to happen is while God is disseminating revelation and that revelation is being given to the church, we need you to be so respectful of the fact that God is speaking and giving this revelation in a miraculous context that we need you to learn how to be silent so that process is not interrupted. Y'all following me? Now, I need you to understand what's happening here. Let me, let me come closer. I don't feel like you're getting it. The, the, the church then had an aspect of their assembly that cannot be duplicated today. They disseminated revelation directly from God through the venue and instrumentality of miraculous gifts. Can't nobody do this today. There's no assembly like this today. So we can't, what we can deduce from this context is what we call principle because this context can't be duplicated. You follow me? So every time you see the word silent, it is because God is saying be absolutely quiet while revelation is being disseminated. And he uses the word silence three times in the context. Tongue speaker, be quiet. Don't interrupt. If you, if, if you don't have an interpreter, I need you to talk with you and God, because right now what you can't do is interrupt this revelatory process. We need absolute quiet. Prophet, if another person gets a revelation, don't you start speaking. When the other prophet is speaking, you be quiet, because one's got to judge it. Be absolutely quiet. Why? Because God is giving revelation. Come here. Look at verse 31. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn, underline the word learn, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. What is biblical edification is when learning is happening. You're not being edified if you ain't learning. You ought not go to a church and not learn. If church is just you coming to somehow feel good but you're not learning, then you're not getting biblical edification. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and that all may be exhorted. What is biblical edification is when learning is happening. All right, verse 32. Watch this. Oh, God, I love how Paul uses these words before he ever gets to a woman. 32. And the spirits of the prophet are subject to the prophet. It means prophet, do not make the claim that you can't control yourself. You can be quiet. Here's what they're saying. A lot of them believed in this ecstatic revelatory process in which when God spoke, they just felt like they had to spontaneously speak. God, here's what Paul says to refute that. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. In other words, your miraculous gift, you being under the influence of the Holy Spirit, your spirit, your inner spirit under the influence of the Holy Spirit that has this gift, it is subject to you. You can control it. Be quiet. Are y'all following this so far? And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, which means, do you see the word subject? Does that not mean submission? The spirit of the prophet makes sure you understand your gift is submissive to you, in which you are not out of control. Watch this, verse 33. Oh, our famous verse. For God is not a God of confusion. Boy, I've heard this one misused. <laughs> Jesus, but I think you know what it means now. Oh, man. Uh, oh, Jesus. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, and in all the churches of the saints. Confusion here is dealing with revelatory confusion, where there is no process to receive revelation in a way where edification takes place. It's confusing because all the tongue speakers are speaking without an interpreter, and the prophets are not moving one at a time, and there is confusion where learning is being hindered. Confusion. I remember one time somebody said, you know what, this was not here, but it was at a Southwestern Christian College lecture where I was invited to do a panel discussion backslash debate on whether you could have multiple song leaders. And um, the gentleman, um, I don't know why you would invite me to any debate. It's just not healthy. <laughs> 
but they invited me anyway, and the gentlemen got on the stage, and they made this really fallacious argument about multiple song leaders is confusion. And they tried to use this text. And I said, sir, you, you know, you're using this text way out of context because this is dealing with the Namantikas Karismata, and because it's dealing with the Namantikas Karismata in this context, the confusion is over the miraculous, not over people singing in your common language. How can it be confusing if all five song leaders on the stage are singing in the language you know? Now the question becomes, the method ain't confusion. If there is confusion, it might be something with your mind, not the process. Because if you got five people up here singing in your language, how in the world are you confused? Now you could say, I am, I don't like it. I mean, that's fair. I don't like that. You know, and when, because I don't like it, you know, it's distracting to me. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. That, that could be true. Um, but don't make it that God's got a problem with it because of your preference. That's not fair. That's not fair to the text. Not, I didn't say fair to anybody. Not fair to the text to assign your issue to God. And they say, God is not the author of confusion. Wait, just because you confused don't mean the confusion was caused by the method. Uh, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches. All right, next verse, 34. The women are to keep silent. Now, ain't no need for a woman to be offended because the tongue speaker had to be quiet. The prophet had to be quiet. And now he says, let the women be silent. Do you see, this is not about an attack on women. This is about making sure the revelatory process is, in, is not interrupted. Now, it is also what we call situational. Situational means whenever Paul makes a statement like this, it indicates there's a problem in the congregation that's happening that he's trying to correct. It means there's a condition that he's addressing. There are obviously women in the church who were interrupting the revelatory process, and with Paul has to now invite them back to a mindset and disposition of submission. Don't interrupt. God is speaking, and we don't want to make this a, a situation of chaos and confusion. Here's what he said. Let the women, are, the, excuse me, the women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. Oh, God. Wait a minute now. You mean you can't talk? Well, the Bible says speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Everybody's got to speak in church at some point. So when he says, I suffer, uh, or I, I don't permit women to speak, I need to know in what context are you saying. The, the speaking here is in a present tense. They are not permitted to keep speaking, meaning this is in a context, uh, the Greek word here is a lot, aleo. It means don't continue to speak in an interruption. You are interrupting this revelatory process. Now, how do you know? It says, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. In other words, this principle of subjection comes from an Old Testament construct in which we want women to be willing to embrace submission and not interrupt this revelatory process. The context is revelation. The context is the exercise of the miraculous gifts. Women do not interrupt this process. Now watch how they were interrupting. Verse 35. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home. In other words, rather than interrupt the revelatory process, ask the Ania of the house, the, the man at home, rather than interrupt the revelation that's being given, ostensibly this is, may have been the wives of the prophets. So the men who are prophesying are giving revelation, and rather than ask questions during this process, ask your prophet man at home. Because he's the one getting the revelation. He's the one receiving it. He's the one disseminating it. A possible interpretation is, ask your husband at home is referring to the wives of the prophets because they're the ones getting the revelation. So you ask them at home rather than interrupt it in church. Do not speak. Speak how? Don't speak in interruption is what this is dealing with. For it is improper for a woman to speak in church, for her to engage in this interruptive process, to speak during this revelatory process, it is improper. Uh, some translations say shameful. Improper is a better word. So what are you doing, Paul? I'm trying to fit 
the disorderly conduct of the tongue speaker, the prophet, and the women that are interrupting because God's revelatory process is being interrupted. That's what this is about. This ain't got nothing to do with a woman being less than a man. This ain't got nothing to do with she can't speak in church at all. This has nothing to do with that. This has to do with an interruption context. To take the position she can't speak in the church at all is but to take that position universally to the tongue speaker and the prophet. All three had to be silent. Are you following that? So the, the idea here in verse 35 is there is women who are interrupting the revelatory process. He's inviting them back into a mind of submission. Not a bad word. It just means have some control, not to interrupt this process. And I'm getting that from the law. Paul would say, I'm getting that from an old covenant construct. Does that make sense? All right, let me see if I can finish the rest of it. 36, was it from you that the word of God, uh, what is it from you that the word of God first went forth? Or has it come to you only? Verse 37, if, and watch this, look, look at who he, he, he's instructing. If anything, he's a prophet, or spiritual, he's going to have to recognize that what I'm writing is God's commands. So you prophets, you spirituals, the spiritual here means those who are under miraculous influence. It's not spiritual like in Galatians 6 where it says you are spiritual, restore such a one. Different connotation. Spiritual here means those who are under the influence of the Holy Spirit to do the miraculous. If you're spiritual or a prophet, acknowledge that what I'm writing is the commandments of the Lord. You prophets, make sure that you understand this process will safeguard that my revelation is uninterrupted. Next time I'll show you in the Old Testament where Paul says, as say of the law. He says, your submission is as say of the law. I'm going to show you in the Old Testament where women sang in leadership positions. Under the law. Under a law that taught submission, there were women who were part of a group called the Singers that led in liturgy. Not in the temple, but led in liturgy. And I want women to reach their maximum potential in this church. I don't want any woman to feel like your gift is not appreciated or that your gift is not valued. It is valued. And there's much you can do in the church. But at the same time, I can't break where Scripture draws lines. I cannot invite you to be the didascale or the preacher. Can't invite you there because God drew a line. As far as I can see, I, I can't invite you into being the anir that prays in the public assembly because there's a line there. Now, uh, oh, I got to close. This, oh boy, this keep silent injunction was for women generically, yet there were women of exception. Who could prophesy? Now, what's that time to get there? In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5, there were women who prophesied, affirmed by Paul, and his real issue with them was that they did it without a head covering. That they did not manifest submission to the custom of that day. Yet there were women, according to the prophecy of Joel, that would prophesy. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. There must have been some setting in which prophecy even of women was permitted. Now, I don't know what setting that was. I don't, I, I don't have an answer to that. Um, I can admit I don't know. I, all I can say was that there was an exceptional women that had the gift of prophecy that had to disseminate that revelation to the church somehow. Now, how they did it, what setting they did it, in light of the injunction in 1 Corinthians 14, I'm not sure how to make that harmonize. I can admit to you I'm not sure. Um, did the injunction, uh, let your women keep silent, generically apply to women, but the accepted women who ha exceptional women who had the gift, perhaps they were allowed to give their dissemination of prophecy. I don't know how they did it, and I don't, I'm not sure in what setting they did it. I'm not sure whether they did it in the assembly or in some kind of assembly. I don't know. What I know is we cannot deny that women prophesy. I know that. Now, let me go a little further. And I said this before, and I'm being redundant on purpose. Prophecy cannot be the equivalent, and I'll do a whole sermon on this later, of preaching. They're not the same. The miraculous is one thing. 
preaching is another, and I'll explain that difference at another time. Stand with me.